Access to nutritious food is one of the most basic human needs. Food provides energy, it powers our immune systems, it defines our cultures and brings people together. Yet today, as a society, we face a difficult challenge. We need to better feed the planet by producing more healthy foods, but at the same time, we need to protect the planet by reducing the environmental footprint of what we eat to manage the climate impact and promote biodiversity. Tackling this challenge will require rethinking the entire nutrition life cycle, how we grow, produce and consume food. Innovative new solutions are already providing opportunities across the entire food production spectrum, from farm to fork. Some companies are using drones to map out and monitor fields to increase crop efficiency. Some are growing plants vertically to increase yields while reducing the environmental impact. We see companies that are searching for innovative ways to make food packaging sustainable, for example by using natural resources. Others are searching for healthier, sustainable food sources, such as alternatives to meat or dairy. These innovations will help us better feed and protect the planet. They also represent a compelling investment opportunity. Sustainable nutrition strategy for a healthier future. Voilà, merci. Euh, bienvenue, chers collègues, chers euh, amis, chers clients, chers partenaires. Euh, ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, dear colleagues. Uh, my name is Pascal Besnard and I have the privilege to wish you a very warm welcome on behalf of Credit Suisse as a region head of Geneva to our conference Feeding the Future. On est très très fier de participer à cette conférence, à ce Building Bridge. Euh, C'est pour nous quelque chose de très important. Et euh, je suis ravi de vous voir nombreux malgré toute la situation sanitaire euh, euh, de ces derniers moments, de ces derniers jours. Et je vous remercie vraiment d'avoir euh, pris le temps de venir nous voir ici euh, à cette conférence. Our division called Sustainability Research and Investment Solutions, SRI, aims to develop innovative advisory, investment, capital market solutions, and content across wealth management, corporate and institutional clients. On a l'objectif de vraiment de mettre à disposition pour nos clients plus de 300 millions dans les prochains, 300 billions de, de, de francs suisses dans des, des investissements ESG dans les dix prochaines années. Uh, by my side today, or almost Marisa Drew, co-host of this event, who unfortunately had to stay in London because of the latest COVID situation, but Marisa is là, avec nous, en direct. Merci beaucoup, Marisa. She is the Chief Sustainability Officer for Credit Suisse and the Global Head of the Sustainability Strategy, Advisory and Finance for the group. She is responsible for setting the sustainable strategy and ambition for the bank. And Marisa played a key role for this conference. Thank you, Marisa, to give uh, our expertise. Uh, and uh, I thank you very much and all the teams uh, who participated to uh, organize this uh, event. The 2030 agenda of the United Nations requires urgent investment. So Credit Suisse is putting its expertise, technology and financial engineering to work for several sustainable development goals. Voilà, j'ai essayé de parler un peu en anglais et euh, bien entendu en français puisqu'on est à Genève et on est fiers d'être à Genève. Et puis euh, je vous souhaite une excellente conférence et maintenant je passe la parole à Marisa Drou. Thank you very much, Pascal, and uh, welcome to ladies, gentlemen, and distinguished Very sorry that I could not be here. Unfortunately, the COVID uh, virus has gotten in the way of my travel plans, but at least I'm here with you virtually. And we have a very exciting program today. So the title of this session is Feeding the Future. And as our video highlighted, as the world marches on to 
a, a number of about 10 billion people by 2050, one thing is very, very clear. The way we produce, consume, deliver, package, and very sadly, waste food is simply not sustainable. So we really do need to be thinking differently, holistically across the entire value chain of our food systems about how at every step of the way, we can think about new and innovative interventions, but we also need to think about mobilizing capital, not only to finance the disruptors, those who are really driving change in the industry, but also we need an enormous amount of investment in traditional industries to help fund the capital expenditures necessary to help them on that transition journey. So a few stats that are incremental to what was in the video. Uh, one thing we know is that the food system, food production is responsible about for about a quarter of the world's emissions. And it's also uh, uh, responsible for about 70% of the water that we consume. Sadly, with all of the production of food that we produce in the world, roughly one third, that is one third goes to waste. And if we think about just the implications of that, not only the land use to produce, typically the pesticides that go into producing the food, the petrol and emissions that are associated with delivering and the packaging, then to waste it is something that honestly, you know, uh, as a statistical matter, I think should bother all of us. So those are some of the negative statistics. On the other hand, one of the things that certainly encourages me and inspires all of us at Credit Suisse every day is that there are those who are acting with urgency to step into these interventions and help deliver change. And that's what we're here to talk about today. Some of those little highlights would be that in the plant-based food system, what we realize is that versus traditional diets, you will have roughly 80% less emissions. And the world is beginning to adopt a plant-based or at least partially plant-based diet, as you see with the proliferation of all these alternatives in our stores and restaurants. And we're very, very fortunate to have one of those disruptors here with us today. Equally, and we think about ways we farm. So vertical farming, we, we saw in the statistic in the video, 350 times more efficient than the food systems today. Um, certainly conventional wisdom is thinking that in urban food systems with vertical farming, we ought to be able to produce about 80% of the needs of a given city. And then those who are there that are trying to influence the provision of capital. And uh, we also have an expert here who's deeply involved in influencing investor behavior to drive that capital change. So let me welcome all of my great panelists today. So first off, and in no particular order, sitting with you in the room, we're very pleased to have Christoph Jenny, who's the co-founder of Planted, which is a plant-based alternative, and hopefully many of you have tried their delicious products. We also have Denis Weinberg, who is the co-founder of Umami, a vertical farming organization and, and disruptor. And then we have my colleague, Alex Stetler, who is part of the Impact and ESG product creation team. So she has been helpful in being the architect for many of the funds that we're able to offer to our clients. And a lot of the research and the white papers that underpin those product launches, including uh, those that are focused on food systems and millennial values and a lot of these themes and trends that are associated with driving this change that we speak about. And then partnering with me virtually, we have Tenny Ekundare. And Tenny is um, head of the investor outreach side of the FAIR organization. For those of you who are not familiar with FAIR, FAIR uses the power of shareholder engagement to drive change. And one of the most impactful things that FAIR has done in its early days was to galvanize trillions of dollars of investor capital to put pressure on companies that are producing and buying products from factory farming. And through the good works of FAIR's intervention, they've essentially all but stopped the practice or massively at least minimized the practice in our fast food systems. So there is a real power when you collectively harness shareholder engagement to drive those outcomes. And then last but not least, we have a wonderful academic joining me here on the virtual stage. 
And I'm very delighted to welcome Professor Alex Mathis, who is the head of ETH's Sustainable Food Processing Laboratory. And who knew in this generation that you could have your own discipline, which is a tenure tract that is focused on sustainable food system and the efficiencies that one can gain if we think differently about food. So it's wonderful to see that, a, that an organization like uh, ETH has such disciplines and has people who are deep subject matter experts helping us to understand and think about ways that we can make these changes that we so desperately need. So with Marissa, your microphone is muted. Sorry about that. Um, somehow it muted itself. Anyhow, so we'll get into a discussion and then um, we will make sure that we reserve time for audience Q&A. So please uh, keep your questions at the ready. So let me just start uh, as, as a little bit of a level setting. Um, how do today our food systems that are affecting climate change that, uh, that are associated with the food system beyond some of the statistics that I outlined um, maybe those of you at a sort of more macro level, you can help us do some of that scene setting. So maybe, Alex, I can turn to a huge number, but, um, but, um, mainly with our animal based production system, which is huge. Um, uh, it's a um, really huge industry where we farm, for example, 1 billion cattle, 19 billion chicken um, um, currently, and uh, just in terms some numbers in terms of how we. Um, you know, process them finally then to final products. We kill and slaughter 50 billion chickens and 1.5 billion pigs every year. I think um, these that's huge numbers that is not needed for a healthy uh, nutrition. We, we don't need that uh, huge amount of animals, so we should really reduce that um, because that is also linked to a lot of issues regarding health impacts of our nutrition because we consume by far too much animal-based products, especially in our developed um, area. And here we have very high meat consumptions in North America, but also in Europe, which we should reduce for sure. And here, uh, for example, meat substitutes can play a significant role to um, make our diet more uh, healthy, more nutritious, and also more sustainable. Perfect. That's a very helpful backdrop. And, and Tenny, um, maybe I turn to you a little bit because you have studied um, at a macro level, but also in very specific interventions. So maybe you can share with us your perspective on some of the facts and figures that are available that are really responsible for showing the impact of today's food systems on the world. Yeah, thanks, Marissa. And um, I think that both you and Alex have, have good, painted a, a do a picture of what it is at the top level. I hate to sound more, even more doom and gloom, but certainly um, as the video uh, that you played says, the way we produce, consume and package the food that we're eating today is not sustainable. And um, as Alex said, it, there, it is quite significantly concentrated in the animal uh, production industry, in the animal processing industry. And so uh, the work that we do at FAIR is very much about helping investors to understand and really start to engage with some of these issues and risks. So we think about, um, when you talk about the amount of animals that are being produced um, and wasted, um, unfortunately, thinking about how it impacts on human health. For example, now COVID, of course, which we're still experiencing and still uh, living through, has shown uh, some of the uh, hotspots that, that existed around the meat processing plants and how that has actually impacted on the health of the workers there, but also their communities as well. And these kind of issues have been going back decades. It's not certainly just because, um, through COVID that we've seen that. Um, when it comes to human human health and the use of antibiotics and the efficacy of antibiotics, something that um, from inception FAIR has been very vocal on. Um, we're really struggling today with, um, with the excessive use of antibiotics, meaning that people are becoming more resistant to antibiotics. So today, probably about 700,000 deaths are attributed to this increased superbugs that we're starting to see. Um, and we see that um, 70 percent of antibiotics are actually used in how we produce our, our meat that we consume so again if we're not being responsible with the use there in the animal uh, protein supply chain then that is impacting on us as well and now alex gave some um, stats around the volume of animals being produced um just to add to that we do have global uh, annually about 70 billion animals being produced and processed each year and the waste that we'll create that um, those animals create is about twice the entire global human population and we're having on this one planet to actually try and deal with that and process that which of course has knock-on impacts on the environment that we're in so 
hopefully through this conversation, we will talk about more about the um, potential and the opportunities that exist in terms of being, being more sustainable and transitioning the system. But certainly there are some real issues in terms of human health, in terms of um, the, our consumption habits and in terms of uh, climate as well, as Alex mentioned as well. So I, I then do want to come back to Alex because, you know, this is your day job, so to speak. Um, you're thinking about efficiencies in food systems. You're thinking about how do we do it better. And of course, you referenced a, a plant-based diet, and we have, have discussed that a little bit or touched on it in any case. Um, but what are some of the other things that you see at your level that can be done that, that give us hope and, and that little bit of a, a North Star guidance of, of how to do it differently? Yeah, I think um, a, a very important starting point and that it's quite often forgotten is if you want to change a system, and I think we want to change that system, we have to first understand our system. And here we would need, for example, system understanding based on sustainability assessment. And that is not only the environmental uh, impacts, that's also social and economic impacts. That's the three-dimensional space of sustainability. And here we have methods available. We published also one of the first multi-indicator sustainability assessments of global food systems um, as a suggestion to use such a framework to quantify our system, our current state, and also the suggested changes which we want to um, integrate into the system, um, whether they are really going into a more sustainable direction. So first, on, on the, let's understand our system, let's develop um, such methodologies, um, let's get the data, which is always a bit um, challenging, especially region specific data, not always the global average data. And then let's change that system based on region specific needs. And here we focus, for example, on the um, reduction of waste, which is the highest priority instead of using waste in a better manner. But uh, first, let's reduce, uh, avoid it, reduce it, and then use it in a better way. For example, by insect based waste utilization as an example for alternative feed production. And we focus also on novel proteins from single cell systems to suggest already the next uh, generation of uh, proteins. Now we focus a lot on plant protein because we have the volumes, but in urban environment, we don't have any arable land. The majority of people is living in uh, urban environments already now. 2050, it will be even 68% of the human population. And there we need to have production systems based on non-arable land, based on single cell systems, for example. Mm -hmm. well, that's interesting that you talked about regional differences and even city to, to uh, perhaps more rural. Maybe touch on that a little bit because um, the world is not uniform. And one of the papers that we wrote at Credit Suisse was trying to make people aware of the direction of travel in some of our developing markets. China in particular is one area that when we discuss the, the deep, deep impacts of livestock, um, as you see 300 million middle-class consumers aspire to eat meat the way we do in the West, if that were to really happen, that would be catastrophic for our food systems. It's already stressed today, but you can imagine um, the implications of that. And then we think about de other developing markets where agriculture is the primary source of people's livelihoods. And if we have water shortages and if we have some of these climate change effects, the ability to actually create the livelihoods will no longer exist. And we talk about climate migrants. A lot of that may be due to uh, the inability to, uh, to have anything that is going to substantiate and, and support the families, particularly in countries like Africa. So, Tenny, maybe some perspective there. Uh, when you do your work, are you thinking very much at uh, public company Western level and change their behavior? Or are you also looking more broadly about those intersection points, you know, that uh, that create that disproportionate and maybe, you know, unequal uh, effect across the world. Yes, absolutely. So we are very much looking at it from that global perspective. And so rather than have it be that we will only assess, say, the uh, more developed markets and look at how it is that they are actually performing and what stewardships that they have in place and policies in place, it, it is a case of starting off on the right foot. So for countries such as China, where it is that that growing middle class is, is expanding quite rapidly. And as you said, there is that increased demand for meat, then it shouldn't be a case of, well, we meet the demand at any cost. It is a case of how do we make sure that we're doing it responsibly and how we actually satisfying the demand that is there not for necessarily animal based, but in introducing those alternatives that exist, whether it's plant based cell culture, etc. So it's really important, I think, that with the work that is done uh, in this space, that we do consider it from that lens of we, we all need to do more, every single region has to do more. And when it comes to the, what that 
more looks like. I think that that's where the regional variations do very much come into play. And so you cannot have it be that you use one brush to paint <laughs> the entire um, globe and say that the um, same operating and manufacturing um, practices and standards need to be um, in place globally. But it is a case of making sure that you are creating the um, the air, the environment where the resources that are in a specific place are being protected as much as, as possible and being utilized in the most effective and, and um, efficient way. And so that's where the data really comes in. And so one of the things at FAIR that we do call for is enhanced disclosure from companies because we want to see and understand as they are operating on the ground in these areas, what is that they're seeing? What is that they're doing? How are they actually measuring, monitoring and, and mitigating these risks and these impacts that they're having on the areas that they're operating on? Whether you are a, uh, a multinational or, or, or a regional company, let's see that information because it helps all of us in terms of as we try to, um, to become more sustainable and as we try to transition. Terrific. So I'm going to stick on that theme a little bit with um, the aspiration in developing markets to perhaps eat the way we eat in the West. And now I want to get a little bit more granular in terms of um, what we're doing to address that in a, in a very specific way. So with the plant-based alternative. So Christoph, I'd like to invite you into the conversation because when, when we think about perhaps the mission that is um, that really f was what drove you to start your company and your business to create a credible plant-based alternative. I often say that, you know, it wasn't that we didn't have a plant-based alternative um, in the 1970s to the hamburger, but at that point in time, it was pretty awful. It didn't look very great. It tasted probably even worse. And, um, and I would probably have suggested back then the cost was uh, greater than, than the alternative. Now we've moved into a world where you can really scale, I believe, because you've through technology and through all of the other work that you know you and, and your peers do in the industry, you create products where the consumer doesn't have to sacrifice. And so I think if we're really going to continue on this mission, um, not only in the West to see adoption, but also to go to tell a developing country who want, doesn't want to sacrifice. You know, they say you all got to benefit from eating that way. Um, you know, you can't really tell me that I sh that I should be sacrificing somehow. Well, if sacrifice isn't part of the equation because you can deliver that that wonderful alternative in taste, in quality, in smell, in texture, and in price, then um, it actually ends up being better all the way around. But Christoph, maybe you can give us first off. You know, what was it that drove you to start the company? What is it that is your guiding mission every day? And, and maybe you could also describe the product itself that you're delivering to the consumer. Thanks. Um, and yeah, essentially, we had the privilege um, being rather close to Alex to have a lot of the data available and actually look at it and understand that fundamentally, I think, as, as uh, both Alex and Terry outlined very well and yourself, too, that this is not the future or if we continue to scale this uh, we'll start to kill off the planet as well as its population because uh, if you want to look at scenarios that feed uh, 10 billion people um, probably the vector or the technology that we use today won't suffice so we asked ourselves how can we build something how can we build a technology a vector that allows us to feed uh, 10 billion people without wrecking the planet and uh, having people starve on the other side of the equation so i think that was let's say uh, how, how we started and then I, I think one one important part to the conversation that we would like to add is it doesn't necessarily have to be a substitute uh, or probably that is not going to convince the majority of the people, but in the end, you need to do a better product. And I think it's three dimensions that you need to be better uh, in. Uh, obviously, taste uh, matters big time. You need to solve the emissions issue. So you got to save uh, CO2 and many of the other negative emissions. And in the end, it's price. Um, because if we want to uh, roll that out to the developing world, um, I think it doesn't suffice that we get something into the shelves of the retail uh, retailers here in Switzerland or in Western countries and then call it quits. Um, but we need to find a technology vector uh, that is tremendously more efficient and then hence also results in lower costs. So I think you need taste, uh, you need better uh, efficiency and you need price in the end. Mm -hmm. So you, you really are hitting it at a consumer level that, that you know, consumers don't want to sacrifice. Um, so whether it's the taste or whether it's the cost, 
you're not going to be able to, uh, I, I think, scale unless you're really delivering both. Can you maybe also, as you were formulating um, the company at its inception some, what, five or so years ago, um, it was a very different world then than now. Um, I suspect then the uh, job to convince people that an alternative product to chicken or whatever is, is the substitute that the plant-based alternative is trying to, um, to deliver on. Um, you know, it was probably more of a sell to the consumer, whereas today you, know, you see these alternatives everywhere. Did, did you experience that? Was that one of your biggest hurdles or, or what were some of the biggest hurdles in the beginning? Yeah, I mean, we looked at the market uh, from a consumer point of view, and we were not really happy with what we saw, and we thought that uh, we can do much better than than what is in the market. Um, so I, I think first of all, we tried to deliver on on, on, a, on a on a personal uh, need and uh, fulfill, let's say, the the joy of uh, having having great products. So I think the first big step was to have a product where we believe in the technology behind it. Uh, that we can tremendously scale and uh, build uh, meat, uh, meat-like structures or protein structures, if you want to get a bit more abstract, um, that are better than the traditional animal-based meat that we were eating. So I think that was or is the biggest uh, challenge. Then second of all, obviously, you need to scale it. Um, we started out in a lab uh, at ETH, uh, which was rather small. It was about 40 square meters. And I think we stepped about on everybody's toe in that department. So um, getting that uh, scaled up, uh, Alex is laughing a bit now. Oh. Um, <laughs> was Alex there sort of uh, pushing you along the way? <laughs> yeah, no, um, uh, Alex was a big supporter. So uh, <laughs> um, no, no, no complaints there at all, uh, rather than a big thank you. So. Um, no, it was about scaling it. Uh, now we're uh, in a factory floor of about 2,000 square meters, and um, we're uh, if we f go fully crazy uh, on that and get every use every little bit of the building, uh, we can do probably about one percent of the chicken uh, market in Switzerland. Um, so if you want to go uh, global, we need to scale that again, and we need to integrate it into a decentralized uh, supply chain. Uh, which I think is the big, uh, big ask, because I think just building mega factory after mega factory will then also not do the job. So you then need to uh, integrate into these urban areas, into these urban food systems that you've mentioned. So I think that is then the big challenge that is now there, that we have, let's say, a technology vector that looks very promising. Uh, we show early consumer adoption uh, to be very good. How do we expand on that uh, one on obviously driving down the price. I think we drove down production costs since the ETH lab days by about 10x. And uh, we need to do that uh, continued to also hit the price points of, uh, let's say, other markets outside of Switzerland. So yeah. it's that uh, expansion, uh, scaling a product, improving the product, getting consumer acceptance and on the other side, uh, integrate into the food system. Okay. So as, as we uh, then hit on this scale point, um, let, let's turn to umami. Um, because, Denny, uh, clearly one of the beauties of vertical farming is this ability to, uh, to produce rapidly and produce with very little space resource. And that uh, surely is a very helpful thing when the land is, is very starved for traditional agriculture. So perhaps, Denny, you could uh, give us a little bit of Again, your your journey, you know, where you started with all of this, what was it that you were trying to solve for? What were some of those early hurdles that you had to overcome? <laughs> hurdles. <laughs> Quite some hurdles. <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, thanks for inviting me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so we, at Umami, we have um, indoor permaculture. And the idea is that we grow food naturally. I mean, sounds very easy, but it's more than just a phrase. It's that we took nature, sort of, and we put it in an indoor building. And the idea is that we produce the best possible food with the help of only nature, um, rather than working against nature, which we do a lot of times uh, nowadays. Um, so that's kind of the idea behind it. Um, but we started that about five years ago, um, there we were just passionate about food and eating food and sharing food. And the idea first was to create a restaurant where we serve food that is produced um, and grown from the corner. Um, and 
thankfully that didn't happen, but we we read a lot about you know production systems and agriculture, how it, how it's done today, um, and we really thought about creating a new system where we can grow really tasty um, and also also ethical, correct food um, at the place of consumption. Um, so yeah, we just. <laughs> You know, we we heard about uh, you know different systems where you can close the loop, um, and there comes aquaponics. I don't know if you heard about it, but the idea is that you have a closed um, sort of water and nutrient cycle where you have animals like fish and other animals together with plants, and uh, the fish with their waste or the animals with their waste they um, create the nutrients for the plants. And vice versa, the plants, they, they grow naturally, they take up these nutrients and they, they clean the water for the fish again. And that's the basic idea behind it. And of course, we, we didn't invent it. The Aztecs have done it a few thousand years ago. But our thought about it and our creation uh, of, of that, you know, of that cycle is that we took that cycle and we, we expanded it into this ecosystem. Normally when you look at aquaponics, it's, it's just a, you know some big, huge tanks with millions of fish and then you have one crop like basil. Um, and we, we took that uh, a, a step further because um, we think that we should also not only you know, focus on vertical farming and, on, on, and now I'm coming to your point to productivity, um, but also on, you know, the way we, we, we scale up and we, we produce uh, our food. Um, and there, our idea is that, like I said, we don't just synthetically throw the nutrients in there and let the, you know, the plants grow like we used to do with the pigs or the chickens. Um, but actually, like also in nature, like in a river or in a, in a lake, um, we have a functioning ecosystem. And... And there, the challenge the challenge is is to balance out this ecosystem. And our experience is the the better the you know the more complex this ecosystem is, the the also the more more um, varieties of, of products you can produce, and the better the taste gets, and the better also the nutrient level of of these plants. Um, so, um, Denny, maybe could, could you, um, this, so the, the principle, this concept of a circular economy where there is effectively no waste, so it's self-sustaining and it stays in a circle, is that really the ultimate goal that you're striving for? Is that the production of the food is in that true circular economy type of a construct or is it, is there sort of nuance and subtlety to that? I mean, that's part of it and I think every, or most of the companies nowadays, they want to reach it because one of the beautiful things is that you know recycling things is not only environmentally interesting but also financially interesting um that's also a core about umami that we try to you know combine environmental sorry um and e economical interests um so therefore yeah of course it is one of the goals um but i would say our vision is because our product that we produce now are microgreens and microgreens is a small plant, like a grown-up sprout. So it's like a plant teenager and grown out of different vegetable or herb varieties. Um, and that is one, one product niche that we started with and that we produce now for the Swiss market. But the, the ultimate vision and idea is that you could put, you know, any plant there or any produce and, you know, produce it at the, um, you know, point of consumption in cities anywhere. Um, also massively scaled um, in terms of any plant you can actually choose. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So it's interesting that both you and in very different ways, you and Christoph are touching on something that I also find provocative, which is you're saying food at the source. And Christoph said it's not going to be really sustainable if we go put up factories uh, everywhere to produce plant-based food and then have to ship the food around. So we need to think in a more uh, constructive way about the actual production, both location probably and and uh, and how. But maybe stepping back macro uh, again, Alex, I could turn to you and ask, 
when you when you step back and look systemically at the food system and you see this this growth in these alternative ways of either farming or the alternative products themselves um do you see uh ways to to fix those logistics problems you know are there good solutions that you've identified to make things more efficient more sustainable um or are we still are we using the new alternatives but n uh, delivering them in the old ways if that makes sense right yeah thank you very much that's a very complex question if you give me an hour for answer <laughs> that question, yeah i would be very glad but we'll I, have to ask the audience if they have an hour <laughs> <laughs> i don't think uh, so so uh, i will try to make it short um i think our global food system uh, is based significantly on trade and that has also certain important advantages because we can grow foods at the place where it's most efficient. We can't grow um, all the foods which we need for our diets um, at every place. So the um, most efficient production, uh, the primary production, has also the major impact on, our, on the environmental footprint. So trade is not, um, is not something bad, but it has to be balanced and uh, used in the right way, for my point of view, first of all. So let's maximize the plant-based agriculture. Let's um, reduce the use of very valuable plant-based biomass as feed. And then again, I come to the point, we have to reduce the animal-based uh, value chains. I don't say that we have to remove them. We still need to have animal-based products for the most nutritious diet. That is also a clear outcome of many um, analyses, for example, also for, uh, for our research um, where we in investigated the Swiss diet um, scenarios. So the uh, majority of our arable land is already used. So when we use it for um, plant-based biomass production, uh, avoid to use as feed, or to make, you know, currently 70% of the Swiss imports of soy is used for feed. I think that is absolutely unacceptable. It's, it's a valuable food source also. So um, let's change a bit this um, ratio. And um, then to create new arable land, um, there is a lot of initiatives globally for, you know, making it by deforestation. I think that is really something we have to stop immediately. That is absolutely unacceptable because that is really, really uh, creating many, many issues. But we can go and move, and that was also mentioned before, on non-arable land surfaces, such urban environments, um, vertical farming. And we go, for example, for precision fermentation. We grow microalgae on rooftops, but also in cellars. You can grow microalgae in the dark, producing yellow biomass, which is currently very popular also for meat substitute production. And here we build up a new laboratory, opening up in January next year in Singapore at the Singapore ETH Center with the Swiss food industry also involved, by the way, also planned and is also partnering there. I think we have a lot of interesting aspects like that. And, um, um, but uh, the, the current food system is delivering important, uh, important uh, uh, diets for our global population. We can't completely disrupt it, but we, we, we should use it wisely, re-innovate re it wisely, and then add um, the new productions on non arable land. So let me ask you a provocative question before I uh, turn the mic over to the next uh, sort of subset of the topic, which is, we are sitting here in this just almost inconceivable phenomenon that half of the world's population is either overweight or malnourished. So we're sitting here with this, these, this barbell end of, of the recipients of the food system or lack of an efficient food system. Um, so is there today enough food to feed the planet and it's a just a redistribution problem or is it more than that in your mind Alex? No, there is a very provocative question for my point of view, we have enough food. Uh, we have, uh, we have uh, enough food production but we will reach our limits and so um, for example if we, you know, we have to reduce of course the food uh, consumption level on, in the developed area to have enough food for the developing area if we would say that um, but if we um, approach now um, dimensions like 9 billion and 10 billion people on our planet, um, currently our food production can't deliver enough food for everybody. So um, then it um, won't be a distribution and consumption problem anymore. Then we have really a lack of production um, capacity. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I also want to um, spend a bit of time on policy making because uh, if we certainly know that in agriculture in particular, subsidies form a very big part of how the food system works. And without subsidies, there are many crops that are probably unprofitable and therefore unsustainable um, from a business matter point of view. And in other cases, um, those subsidies provide a very, very valuable and necessary perhaps redistribution in some cases of getting food to where it's needed. 
Um, I guess when I step back and I think about the ability to uh, think strategically about influencing policymakers, Tenny, um, maybe you could spend a bit of time with us on thinking through that. There's, you know, um, is it a subsidy question? Are there nudges and other things that need to happen if we're going to create the enabling conditions for these changes that we so desperately need? Yes, absolutely. I think that um, it's an excellent point in terms of the subsidies that actually goes into the animal um, protein at the moment. And the fact that you're seeing increasingly governments start to talk about how there do need to be dietary shifts. So uh, we've had the uh, national dietary guidelines come out from about 100 countries. Um, we've had the UK and Denmark specifically calling for about a 30% reduction in terms of the meat consumption. So there is starting to be recognised um, at the highest level that the food system that we have and the way we consume animals does need to be um, to be changed and, and to be uh, redirected in some way, shape or form. So yes, there's subsidy reform and that's something that actually uh, we have been calling for. Um, and we actually have a, a small uh, coalition which is at, which is working with governments and actually talking to um, governments about the need for subsidy reform. There's also um, other economic incentives about such as tax, of course. So we've seen how when it comes to the sugar tax, how that's influencing diet, influencing diets. We've seen tobacco tax, and what that's done is a as a lever to be pulled when it comes to um, changing consumers' uh, habits and patterns. Could there be some kind of carbon tax on meat as well? So that's something that does need to be, um, I think, considered, and also something that investors also need to be aware of in terms of this is a, a something potentially coming down the the pipe and, and down the pipeline. Then, of course, we have the, the regulation and standards such and disclosure as well. So if it were that we were to see uh, or have a clear idea of or have it be more um, visible in terms of some of these impacts and some of these um, ESG issues, then again, it gives information that's required in order to then um, make informed decisions. So we've had recently when it comes to climate risk, for example, and we have the Science Based Targets Initiative, we have TCFD, etc. Um, and we've also had the IFRS recently announce the um, International Sustainability Standards Board at, that was at the start of this month, which is going to be helping to actually create a global baseline for, um, for the data that's, um, or for sustainability related data. And again, helping investors be able to compare like for like and apples for apples. So that, again, it is arming people with, with the knowledge that's required. And so you have it. So when it comes to regulation, right? So we have the good, uh, more robust standards in order to make change. We have the incentives um, or disincentives, certain areas of the market, and then incentivizing others. Um, and then finally, I've also mentioned that we have commitments and pledges from governments as well. So coming out of COP26, we've had the global methane pledge, uh, which was um, which is to set to reduce methane um, emissions by about thirty percent. Now, about 40% or just over 40% of methane emissions actually comes from our animal production system. So if we are going to see those um, commitments being made, then it means that these countries and these governments recognise that animal agriculture has to be part of that solution as well. And Alex mentioned deforestation. Again, we're seeing global deforestation pledges, and we know that, that effectively cattle rearing is the number one cause of, of deforestation. So therefore, significant um, changes required and needed there. So I think that there are things that governments can actually do and policymakers and regulators can do. And we are starting to see that start to come through and come to place. So again, that support for the transition that we that we really need. Mm -hmm. So one of the things certainly at COP that there was a lot of discussion about was um, this is all of these, these environmental topics and the food system in particular as well. Um, all of these are bigger than just a government issue or a private sector issue. It's both have to work in harmony, um, but sometimes they work in disharmony. And before we leave the sort of subsidy and or uh, notion of, of where incentives or disincentives may lie, um, I'd love to ask any of the panelists to comment on this, whether you are in the disruptive category and might be facing this or at a macro level. But um, certainly when I talked to some of the early disruptive companies, one of the issues that they faced were, were lobbying groups from the traditional industries that really didn't want to see them exist. So uh, we certainly know there's a very, very large, say, cattle lobby in America um, that really doesn't want to see cell-based meat uh, come into the fore, and they lobby very hard to the FDA, which is the U.S. Uh, regulator and food systems um, facilitator for uh, approving new products on the market. I'm just curious, maybe um, I could ask that question of, of Christoph. Did, did you face that same sort of 
pushback um, when you were starting your business? Was there, or was that, was there an easier path to you because you were plant-based and you weren't so much in the face of competing with a traditional um, animal industry? No, so I mean, that for us is a big topic, obviously. Um, I think uh, a level, level playing field would already go really far, uh, not even going into uh, taxation of meat yet, but uh, uh, imagine if tobacco or if the state would have done the tobacco ads uh, back in the days. That's what's happening in Switzerland. So uh, 8 million each year uh, go from the state uh, to, to um, advertising for animal-based meat. Um, we also have various issues of the meat lobby, basically uh, writing uh, government uh, policies uh, forbidding us what to call the products so that we say it's an analog to chicken, yeah. for example, uh, is a big topic uh, which uh, we face in multiple jurisdictions. And last but not least, I think to put it really bluntly, um, if you would uh, were to import, so we uh, import uh, a yellow piece, the protein of it, um, it's uh, one of our key ingredients. It's not grown in Switzerland, uh, it's not produced in Switzerland, so we import it uh, from the European Union. Um, we get taxed three times as much uh, as you would do if you were to feed it to an animal, hmm. which is completely insane. Uh, why would you tax by use and why would you have a lower tax rate for animal production uh, rather than uh, plant-based alternative? Pretty crazy. Pretty crazy. So, um, Alex, you know, when you think about then these systemic um, solutions, how much of this is needs to be uh, changing those types of phenomenons, those taxes, those disincentives, those perverse and perhaps um, not necessarily well understood, you know, implications of some of those policies, or maybe they are very well understood, <laughs> and the lobby guys are winning. I don't know, but uh, love your your thoughts on that. Yeah, no, thanks. Um, that was a very um, um, good example here. I think what is what is uh, going wrong in our system, and here I would suggest again um, objective methodologies and data. Um, and here we have a methodology, for example, life cycle costing, uh, which is quantifying the product or service um, or the economic sustainability performance of a product or service. And then you can um, quantify the direct and indirect cost, and that can be, can be then visualized and then discussed. And this is um, absolutely a problem that a lot of benchmark um, products, and not only, by the way, animal-based products, <laughs> that's the case for many other products on the market, um, there are um, a lot of hidden costs in, involved, also hidden costs in terms of environmental impacts, which are then paid somewhere else by taxpayers to be compensated. And we can quantify these things, and I would strongly suggest um, to go forward with such a, a methodological approach and to make that transparent. Mm -hmm. What's Marissa? Yes, please. Sorry, I just, I just wanted to add something really quickly in terms of... Um, that as you, you um, were talking about the alternative proteins and how you have seen a lot of the um, lobbying happening and some of the issues around around that. Just say that I think as consumers have also started to really embrace um, the alternative proteins and plant-based um, options that exist today, then the traditional animal agriculture, animal um, processes have also started to recognize that actually this is a, a money-making opportunity for them effectively. And so we are actually seeing within FAIR, we uh, assess 60 of the largest global protein producers. And there has been a rapid shift over the last three to four years in how many of them are actually starting to develop and spend R&D or, or M&A activity in terms of some of these alternative proteins. So it's not just the plant-based side of things, which they're um, expanding mm -hmm. to, but also that cultivated meats area as well. So I think that we are, as we engage with these companies, we do encourage them to recognize that um, there is this potential solution out there to a lot of the um, ESG impacts that they have. And we are certainly starting to see that in our index, at least almost half of them now from only about six companies a few years ago now have some kind of exposure there. So I expect that we will see that continued rapid in innovation there. And so that's a, a cause for, for hope, certainly, and that there's going to be even more um, going on in that space as well. 
Well, there's a classic American phrase that says, if you can't beat them, join them. And you're absolutely right that we're seeing some of the largest food companies in the world make investments in a lot of uh, businesses like uh, Christoph and Denise business. And, and I think that's smart. Just, just because, maybe to, um, to if you add. Don't do that, you're going to probably be disrupted out of business. So that's a perfect segue because I don't want to forget my wonderful colleague, Alex, as we move into the finance topic. Um, so clearly you touched on it, Tenny, and, and uh, all of you actually touched on the enormous opportunity and I definitely say if you are solving a systemic problem, if you are solving a necessary problem, almost by definition, if you have a solution, that is going to be a sustainable opportunity to create real value. And I think the investment community is beginning to see that as are the traditional food companies. But Alex, maybe you can touch a little bit on what you're seeing from our clients, whether they be private clients as investors and, and trying to deploy their own personal wealth into some of these topics or uh, the institutional community. You know, how advanced do you think they are on this food topic in particular and the value creation opportunity? And what are some of the, the, the themes that you're seeing in terms of what investors really wanna see when they put capital into uh, nutritional and food solutions? Um, yes, sure. I mean, up until very recently, most of the opportunities you could find in the food system was mostly in the private markets. Uh, what we're seeing today is that because there's so much interest, because there's so much demand, uh, a lot of these companies are now going public, uh, and you see also opportunities in the public space uh, to invest in companies uh, that are listed on the stock exchange. Uh, back in June, Credit Suisse published um, a report on the food systems where we've essentially started with the private market, looking at how many alternative proteins companies were back in 2000, and we saw that there were only about 100, uh, and now we're at more than 650 companies in the alternative protein space, which shows the huge interest that investors have in this topic. Uh, if you look at last year, 2020, there was $3 billion, uh, that was invested in alternative meat startup uh, companies. That doesn't seem like a lot, but if you compare to 2019, that's three times higher. So there is a huge uh, interest from investor into this topic. Um, it used to be only in the private space, but now we're seeing more companies going public, and we're seeing also the big food conglomerates that are also starting to change uh, how they do their business. They're also starting to uh, look into this kind of alternative food, vertical farming, all those innovative activities, and they want to embark on the journey as well. Uh, so as investors, uh, you can now invest both on, in the private market as well as in the public market, um, making really a, a huge investment opportunity for, for investors. And Alex, maybe um, when we think about investing in public companies, mm -hmm. for those investors that really want to see or believe that the benefit of their investment dollar is driving change, um, often one would say, well, if you're a tiny shareholder in a large public company, you're really not influencing the outcomes. You might be participating in riding those those companies' waves of change, but you're not actually your dollars not making that that, that tangible difference. Um, are there opportunities in the public markets where that linkage is more direct in your mind? Um, yes, of course. I mean, of course, um, in private equity, every dollar that you invest is going to have a, an impact because you're providing capital to to that company to grow. In the public market, that's a bit more difficult. However, you can still make an impact in the public market if you are to go for an active engagement strategy. Uh, what that means is that you're going to select the companies that you want to engage with, that you want to have a dialogue with, and your strategy is going to be to really talk to the company uh, on specific topic and try to change some of the aspects of the company to make it more impactful, uh, more environmental friendly, and so that they develop a better product for our society or for our planet. So while it's less impactful as what you could have in private markets, if you are to do um, active engagement strategy in, in public strategy, that's where you can have the, the highest impact, definitely. 
And, and Tenny, I think that's a lot of what FAIR is about, uh, which is, and maybe not in an individual investor level, but a collective level, uh, saying, I, want, I will only invest if you do the following things, or if you don't, perhaps the inverse of that is true, I will divest. Um, how, how much value driver is associated, you know, value creation or destruction as the case may be, I guess, if you're divesting, uh, in that kind of a powerful shareholder collective? I mean, I think that having that um, collective voice does make such a huge difference in terms of trying to drive some of the change. So uh, when it comes to uh, antibiotics, which we started out engaging with the restaurant and retail, um, with the restaurant companies and fast food companies at the um, in 2017, uh, we've seen that um, go from having one of the companies in that engagement with a policy, with an antibiotics policy that's applied to their supply chain to all 20 companies at the end of that engagement, having a policy or in the process of developing a public policy. Um, when it comes to sustainable proteins, we engage with uh, 25 retailers and manufacturers about what are they doing to, um, one, understand the importance of um, addressing the animal protein parts of their portfolios for climate, for climate risk mitigation and the strategic opportunity to that that plays as well and we've got almost 18 trillion dollars of investor support for that and across our engagements really whether it's looking at working conditions antibiotics um sustainable proteins um aquaculture and biodiversity risk we have about 40 trillion dollars of investor assets signed up to um to engage with these companies it helps because it means that even if you are a relatively small investor or relatively small holder of, of some of these companies your voice is still heard uh, you're still um, able to get access to these companies to speak to them to um ensure that your views are, are taken into account as well and um similarly it means that for the companies rather than engaging with um, hundreds of different um, individual um, institutions, they can actually have a, a much more powerful collective engagement. And we find that investors and companies give really good feedback in terms of the, um, the value that they feel that they gain from these collaborative engagements and how for some of the corporates, it even helps them internally to be able to show that, look, this really does matter to investors. We really do need to take um, to pay attention and sit up and take notice on, on some of these issues. Oh, you, you've got on mute again. Oops, sorry, I was going to say, uh, I think for Denis and Christoph, um, I think there might be a special Christmas prezi in the mail for you for all the good work you're doing that, that and, and definitely it benefits their companies as, as you try to drive the change more toward plant-based and more efficient uh, farming techniques. Um, so I guess, unfortunately, sadly, uh, the, the, I'm watching the clock here and it is ticking along very rapidly. I'm sure we could uh, carry on the conversation for a much longer period of time if, uh, if we were allowed. But I'd like to perhaps um, ask each of the panelists to give us maybe one hopeful message or uh, maybe in the case could be a sobering message. But what do you think uh, the, fu the future of the food system will be when you look out 10 or, or 20 years? How will we be eating? How will we be farming? How how will we be investing? Love a little bit of looking through that uh, that glass ball for some some predictions as we round out uh, a very active year for the food space. So uh, perhaps I can start um, with the first question to uh, to Christoph. Yeah, for us, our view is obviously very product driven. So at the end, we believe uh, that, let's say, uh, we get to that famous 25% uh, of people um, will by 2030 eat their proteins non-animal based. And it will be products that are better, as said, in every category. So be that taste, price and impact on the environment. Okay, short and sweet and well said. All right. How about Denis? Um, I think really the point of, you know, grow, eat, um, live locally um, will have a, you know, much more than just as a trend, but, you know, a long lasting impact on how we, how we live, you know, also topic of flying around and being everywhere and global. And, you know, I think this is something that I think will have a, a long, long lasting impact. And also I wish for that um, because I think, yeah, otherwise we're going crazy. <laughs> so a man for the anti-globalization movement. <laughs> All right, and, and Alex, from your side of things on the investor side, fund side, AUM side? 
yeah, I think we already see it now. There's more and more uh, investment solutions coming around the topic of nutrition. This will not stop. Um, we are going to see more and more uh, solutions coming now. We see a lot in alternative proteins. Maybe in the future we see it with insects. With We see it with lab-grown uh, foods. Uh, these are all things that we can't really invest in as a private client at the moment, but maybe in the future that's something that's certainly uh, will be feasible and that um, investors will be able to, to invest in. So then, Tenny, for you in the next decade or 20 years, are you going to uh, be so effective that you're going to, uh, you, you will no longer need to exist because the job is done? <laughs> Well, I think that's um, certainly for, for fair, because it is a case of transitioning to a more sustainable food system. Um, yes, animal agriculture is part of that, but also actually with the um, alternative proteins, we do need to make sure that we are not then setting these companies up for another ESG issue from in 20, 30 years. So it's about how do we ensure that they are actually getting sustainability embedded fundamentally in terms of their sourcing, their working conditions, their governance, etc. So I think there'll always be the need for um, for, for fair, so we, we we feel so. Um, but I think what we'd all agree on is that certainly innovation is here and will um, there will continue to be rapid innovation in the years to come. It's almost a matter of, well, how much is there going to be? And so what kind of percentages should we start thinking about the reduction that we'll see in the, the animal protein um, part of the of our diet? And so at FAIR, we have a range of between, say, 16% of uh, protein coming from um, alternatives by 2050, all the way up to 62% coming from alternative protein. Protein. So that change is going to happen. It's just a matter of how rapidly it does and, and how high we're able to, or how huge the this, this shift is going to be. And that's from where today? What, that and that's from about 1-2% of, um, of global protein today. Okay, so in any case, it's a massive multiplier massive effect. Therein lies that, that amazing opportunity for the investor as well. Mm -hmm. And then last word to Alex, is uh, sustainable food going to be a prerequisite for every ETH student in the future so that they can be a good global citizen on the food system? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, no. Um, I think we have great students, um, great talents here at ETH, but also in many other uh, universities which partner with us. And uh, I believe the future will be bright, diverse. We will keep a lot of traditional foods. You know, the food sector is a conservative one. Consumers are very conservative. They love their very traditional foods, but we will also see many, many new ones. And I hope we can move the direction in the more sustainable uh, um, uh, direction, especially, you know, less animals, more plant-based and single cell uh, based uh, uh, food products, which are healthy, nutritious, affordable and available. Well, with all of that great intellect and all of that passion across the collective group here uh, today on this panel, I have uh, a lot of a lot of hope for the future of the food system. Um, so maybe I could just ask everyone to join me in thanking my wonderful panelists, but I also would like to offer up the opportunity. Um, I think I will uh, have the benefit of a bit of time if those of you who are in the audience would care to ask some questions. If you do, um, your mic, you could just turn your mic on and raise your hand and, and Pascal, my partner, will select those to, uh, to, to try to then I can help to, uh, to field those questions. Is my mic working? Yes. Yes, it is. Um, thanks so much. The discussion was really transparent and uh, more open than I thought it would be. And j just to give the provenance of my comment, um, where, where I'm coming from, my belief is that uh, there is a sustainable food system for the future should contain uh, no or minimal animal products and, and dairy. And, and just from a kind of health-based uh, approach. Uh, I think Game Changers sort of debunks the need for uh, animal-based protein in, in the diet. But I'm not. I'm not getting involved in in the ethics debate. I think there's a lot of similarities today to how fossil fuel companies are being analysed and. Um, you know, fossil fuel companies are judged by their transition for the future, and we've got some very clear metrics for that. Scope one and scope two emissions, bad. Green revenues and emission, um, green revenues and avoided emissions, good. So, so my question is, you know, more around this transition approach for the future of our food system. Um, what metrics do you see where we can put quite similar? ESG values on, on measuring and managing the risks inherent in a food system? And there, are there any regulatory developments or standardization of this 
coming along that we should be aware of to help us as investors manage these ESG risks? Thanks. Well, I think maybe I would ask both uh, probably Alex and Tenny to, to comment. I think Tenny did raise um, some of the movement that we're seeing in the ESG ecosystem around harmonization of information. So this initiative under IFRS that's bringing together all these disclosure regimes, which were a little bit disparate and a little bit geographically focused, and it was very hard, I think, to, to find a common system. So with all of those coming in together uh, under the auspices of IFRS and creating in, in due course what I think is tantamount to a new accounting system for sustainability, that information on an industry specific line item basis will, I think, create a lot of transparency investors to pick and choose you know, who are doing things well. But, um, but love the, the views of, of, of anyone who wants to comment, but I suspect there's some a metrics question there with the good work Alex does. Um, and Tenny, your experience in interacting with the investment community. Yes, Marissa, so as you, you said, in terms of the work that the IFRS is doing and, and the launching or the announcement of the um, ISB board um, earlier on this year, I think that there is certainly a point to be made in terms of the difficulties with the data that we have at present. And so where you have it that you, uh, a net zero commitment, for example, isn't necessarily the same thing from one company to another. And so there does need to be that understanding from uh, people, from investors who are looking at these companies and trying to assess that climate risk in terms of what does that individual company's net zero commitment actually mean? Are they looking all along their supply chain, trying to capture those scope three emissions, which is so difficult to quantify? Um, are they thinking about um, offsetting using um, carbon offsets in terms of actually meeting that target? And so therefore, in terms of the quality of the net zero commitment that they're actually making. But I think that um, as uh, as the, as data has evolved, as the demand that investors and corporate and consumers have for uh, better data um, has increased, then we are starting to see that um, that evolution and we are starting to see more granular data become available. And so that you can start to ask those awkward questions of the companies in terms of, so you're targeting net zero by 2050, but it looks like it's only on your scope one and scope two emissions. What are you doing with the fat tail of scope three, depending on which industry they're in? Um, and so I think that, uh, as as I said, there there will continue to be um, the call out for, for better data and you will start to see, um, yes, it, you will start to see that some improvements continue to happen, really. I also think there's an element somewhere in here about ensuring that we are um, encouraging companies uh, to um, behave in the right way, but making sure that's uh, uh, from a basis of information, whether it's academia or client, climate science, because I do feel sometimes that, especially in agriculture, um, you know, and we're trying to set climate solutions. I think about the old world where everybody jumped into ethanol as the as the grand solution to eliminate petrol, and we went and we replanted so much agricultural land with corn to produce this biofuel, and then we destroyed destroyed a lot of the biodiversity in those fields because it was a monocrop and it didn't work anyway. And the emissions associated with that were destructive. And so if you looked at the entire chain of that activity, it was completely counter to what it was trying to solve for. So I think there's, there's something here in helping investors understand both what is the right intervention, but also uh, the laws of unintended consequences, making sure that we understand that better. But maybe Alex, you know, you're deep in, into the food system. Uh, you can comment on that as well. Yeah, thanks very much. You gave already a very important example of the first generation of bioeconomy initiatives, from, also strongly driven by the European Commission. Um, yeah, that was a misdevelopment from my point of view. But, um, you know, if we analyze this, that if we analyze changes um, a bit uh, in advance by using sustainability assessment methodologies and the environmental sustainability assessment, that is even ISO norm, you know, we have methods, we need to have proper data, but nowadays we have a lot of good data, then uh, let's use um, these tools. And I think that is significantly underdeveloped and we don't use the tools which we have available. Academics can deliver um, objective data, but there are also a lot of initiatives uh, running um, in the private sector, but also on the regulatory um, uh, framework. The European Commission tries since a long time, since several years, to initiate the product environmental footprint label on food products. And uh, it's so complicated, you know, what type of impact you take, of course, greener, greenhouse gas emissions, land use, energy demand, but is the consumer understanding that label, you know, the nutrition facts are already quite often confusing. So, um, yeah, and here we need to team up also with communication experts, with consumer insight experts to really um, understand what would be the best uh, uh, 
label on such a product and, uh, and gives a reference. You know, now we have even the nutrition score also initiated in Switzerland, you know, red, yellow, and green, you know, and well, I'm not a big fan of it because it's uh, sometimes a bit misleading, but at least we can communicate to the consumer an important information. And I think here we should really do our job better. We have the tools available. Perfect. May we take another question from the audience? Um, yes, my question is, um, do you believe the, the food or the habits or the way we eat has already been disrupted enough or are we going for a full disruption to, be, uh, to have a solution? And is this unblocked by lobbies or by, by us having our eating habits which are not changing enough? Right. Um, I, I'm sure there are many um, angles to answer this question, but I see uh, Christoph nodding his head very vigorously. So maybe Christoph, how about if you take that one? Yeah, so uh, again, we do have data on that and it's pretty evident. I mean, we're still in the single digits. And so I, I think we really need to solve that uh, consumer, uh, uh, let's say, adoption. And it's very, it's very typical, right? You have the, the very, very, uh, the innovators who are the first, they're typically two and a half percent, and it actually fits it really well, right? Then now you have to get the, let's say, the early adopters, and, and then you go mainstream. So uh, with food, uh, as Alex pointed out, it's a very traditional thing. So uh, as if you want to transform something fundamentally, um, it takes time. Um, I think it both takes time on the product as well as on the consumer side. And I think that's the important message on, 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 on the investor side, right? Why is a lot of this private and not yet IPO'd, uh, et cetera? And, and that's one of the main reasons, right? If, if you want to fundamentally change something, uh, it, it takes some time. And uh, probably you see some very early, let's say, companies go, go, go listed. That, that, that's more maybe a marketing thing today. But uh, if you fundamentally want to do that and we want to do it right way, it, it, it will take um, time. I think it's probably fair to say that um, I think the, the conditions for mainstreaming or scaling are across the consumer behavior change and adoption. It's across uh, the regulatory environment. It's across the food, you know, producers. I, I think it's it's you know there isn't one one solution here. I think it's it is a fairly systemic type uh, of an answer. Um, but the good news is you see people participating in from all those disciplines in trying to create that change. Perhaps, uh, Pascal, maybe one more question? Um, can I go ahead? Uh, Again. Sorry, awful. I wasn't sure what was happening with the feedback. Um, I wanted to direct this question particularly to FAIR. We're, we're a member of uh, FAIR. Uh, we're a boutique manager that um, has a, uh, uh, a mission, essentially, of taking all animal agriculture out of all portfolios, um, all animal exploitation, and also investing in um, all of the alternative uh, protein uh, solutions. Um, and one of our uh, products um, is taking both fossil fuel and animal exploitation out, actually achieving 75% less carbon than the index, and in terms of water and waste, something like 95% less than the index of both. So the numbers that you were quoting earlier are actually just animal agriculture, not the entire supply chain of animal product usage, which uses an enormous amount more water and generates an enormous amount more waste. Now, FAIR has um, accumulated several trillion of assets in terms of the um, people that have signed up for your programs, but your FAIR stands for Farm Animal Investment Risk and Return. I would like to ask what Invest, what risks investors are taking if they keep their money with those very large asset managers that conceivably could not actually sell out of these exposures, which will turn out to be stranded assets at the end of the day, just like the fossil fuel oil reserves. Sorry, in terms of the, when you say in terms of what risks the investors are taking, I think that that completely sums it up very well in terms of the risk of these becoming stranded assets. And so 
therefore similar to how we've seen the um, fossil fuel industry um, and the disruption that we've seen in the fossil industry. Similarly, in food systems, we have the same um, issues and risks going on. And so that's why for investors, it is a case of you need to understand the companies that you're investing in. You need to understand their business model and how they are being part of that transition. So as I mentioned, in terms of seeing uh, that really uh, swift increase in terms of the number of companies in our, certainly in our protein producer index, which is looking at the uh, largest animal meat processors and how rapidly they are starting to embrace and um, engage with the alternative protein um, industry and seeing that as, as I said in terms of a business opportunity as well as a way to offset their um, significant ESG impacts that that's, um, that they have. So as, as I mentioned in terms of deforestation, the number one cause of deforestation, um, waste and water uses, antibi excessive antibiotics usage, etc. All these are uh, at a nexus when it comes to the um, animal uh, protein supply chain. And so all these, when it comes to the protein processors and producers, means that if you actually were to address, say, climate and the impact that this industry has on climate, you'd also be benefiting the um, the planet when it comes to uh, human health and antibiotics excessive usage, uh, when it comes to biodiversity and the impact there, and uh, when it comes to waste, as, as I mentioned, in terms of twice the volume of waste being produced by the animals that we're rearing to eat versus humans living on this planet. So yes, certainly there are significant ESG risks um, involved in this space. And so that's why it is that these companies and, and investors in these companies need to um, understand these risks and engage with them, which is something that FAIR does um, work very hard on in terms of helping companies to um, meet investors around the table and actually understand what they're trying to do about mitigating the impacts they're having on all of us. Terrific. Well, I think perhaps, um, unless there's one more burning question, we should probably bring the session to a close. Um, Pascal, you're in the room. You'll have to guide me. <laughs> yes, uh, I think we, there is no more questions, so I, I let you... Uh, okay. Perfect. Close the, the session. Well, as I said before, um, I, I do think with um, the power of the passion and uh, the the application of a great deal of energy and intellect, it does leave me hopeful. This is my what gets me up in the morning in, in the sustainability role and uh, keeps me going on those dark days when, when climate mitigation and some of these challenges feel all too hard. Uh, the power of human ingenuity has has proven itself many, many times over, and I think the food system is in no different place as, as we can see from today's discussion. So thank you very much to my panelists. Much appreciated for all the good work you're doing, and thanks to all of you in the audience for, uh, for your listening and, and your participation, and hopefully your investment dollars going in the right direction. So thank you very much. And I would like to thank you, you Marisa, huh, to have done that uh, from London. Thank you very much. Your expertise and, and uh, uh, yes, your your, uh, your words. And I would like to thank you all, uh, the panelists, uh, in the name of Credit Suisse, to be with us uh, this evening. And uh, I think that we have keep the apéro. So uh, you have all the information at the, uh, near the door here. And uh, it's my pleasure if you can join us for the for the apero, and we can continue to discuss about these important topics. So and by the you. way, we should say that the uh, you're having the chance to sample some of these wonderful uh, sustainable products. So <laughs> that is, that is a gift, and all very consistent with the ethos and the theme of this evening. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Huh? Thank you very much. Thank Bye. you. Thanks very much, Marisa and Tini. Yeah, all the best for you. And um, it was really interesting and uh, really a pleasure to, to discuss with you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Very much you. enjoyed your comments. <laughs> Bye, Marisa. Bye. Bye. Ciao.